since 2012, every year we have a panel on that. The first year I could not make it because no companies were ready to come and speak of what happened in their supply chain. The second year, which was 2013, a lot of them accepted to come. And the reason why was that in between, you had Rana Plaza. And the big building in Bangladesh that collapsed because um, of uh, you know, the poor state of the building. And many corporations realized that their brand could be damaged very quickly if they didn't pay attention to the, 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 the working issues of their workers. So um, it is interesting that we discuss that and more and more we have important companies. To, to today we will have Walmart and Adidas speaking of their effort. Um, last year we created at, um, at the foundation uh, the Stop Slavery Award. The Stop Slavery Award is, is an Anish Kapoor uh, statue uh, that he created on purpose. And it is given to corporations which are best in class to try to clean the supply chain from forced labor, to try to clean the supply chain, because no company today can say, I'm slave free. So uh, last year, for the first time, we gave the winners. It was the uh, NXP Semiconductors and uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, the, 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 the award is open to any corporation who want to be uh, a candidate. They have to fill a questionnaire that took one week to their chief procurement officer to fill because it's a very, very detailed questionnaire that we prepared with Baker and McKenzie, the law firm, and with all the specialists of the supply chain. And to my great surprise, for the first year, we had a lot of big corporations candidates like uh, Apple, Tesco, uh, um, uh, Thai Union, uh, Fortescue, etc. So big corporations that accepted to, to, to be linked to slavery were not afraid to apply for an award which has slavery in its names because it is what it is. And, and it, it was very comforting to see that the efforts that all these companies do to try to clean their supply chain are really amazing. Not enough, only two of them received the awards, but uh, hopefully this, this year we will have 10 of them receiving the awards. So be candidate. <laughs> Um, so, the, 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 when it comes to trafficking and forced labor, the equation is, uh, until now, low risk and high returns. We need to change this equation. Uh, according to the State Department, there were just 857 prosecutions in the entire world for labor trafficking and servitude in 2015. We don't have the numbers for 2016. Of those 857 prosecutions, there were 456 convictions. 456 convictions. That's a very small number compared to the 45 million slaves in the world that walk free speak of. Companies are increasingly aware of the risk they face if their supply chain is tainted and a few laws have been taken, uh, notably in the UK, in the US, as Cindy mentioned, uh, to look into that. But supply chains have become too, so complex that they are very challenging to monitor. And even the corporations that want to do the right thing are struggling to have full visibility over the working condition of them, those at the bottom of the chain. Um, the, the increased media attention, I mean, it was interesting when Dipendra before spoke of uh, the media attention in Qatar because of the World Cup. Uh, the media attention, I can tell you, is extremely important. And at the Reuters, Thomson Reuters Foundation, we have a team of journalists, and we have journalists focusing only on human trafficking and slavery. And especially two journalists in India covering it on a daily basis. And... Um, all the companies that were shortlisted for the Stop Slavery Award, two things. The 10 of them had had, had media attention for either wrongdoing in their, in their um, operations, like Apple, or uh, danger of uh, forced labor in their supply chain. And immediately they react and they act. 
uh, private sector can hack very quickly where, uh, obviously, uh, in governments it's much slower to take a law, to enforce it, to implement it, etc., etc. So it's very interesting that media intention helps company to do the right thing. To honor the company, so, so this, is, this is why we did um, the Stop Slavery War. We are going to watch quickly a video and then we have the panel. We know the clothes we wear and the everyday items we use may be produced by forced labor. Before a product lands on our high street, it must be manufactured, packaged, and distributed. In today's globalized world, this is a complicated process, linking many different suppliers in many countries. Take a t-shirt. Before it hits the shelves, different pairs of hands will have picked the cotton, cleaned it, and compressed it into bales spun and woven it into thread, then cut, stitched, sewn, labeled, ironed, and packaged it. At every step, there is a risk of labor exploitation. Or look at the seafood sector, where horrific abuses have been uncovered. Take shrimp. Men working on trawlers that catch fish to feed farmed prawns are often kept aboard against their will. They aren't paid, and some have even been killed if they've been disobedient or just plain tired. But also, in peeling sheds where prawns are cleaned for export to our supermarkets, workers are often locked in and can be as young as 12. In Thailand, many of those enslaved are migrants, often from Myanmar, who've come to earn money for their families but have no documents to work legally. In Africa or India, they may be children forced to work in mines to extract the minerals used in our smartphones and computers. Governments, business leaders, and companies increasingly recognize that they may have forced labor in their supply chains. What measures can we take? How do we ensure commodities are sourced in an ethical way? What more can we do to ensure our products are slave-free? Uh, on the panel that we are going to listen to now, we have uh, Aditi Wanchu. Come, come and sit now, all of you. Uh, she's the senior manager in, uh, for social and environmental affairs at Adidas. We have Doug Nistrom, who is director of human rights uh, and responsible sourcing at Walmart. We have Andy Hall, who is a human rights defender and international affairs advisor to the Migrant Workers Rights Network. He was condemned for in se last September in Thailand uh, for doing his job, which is to defend the rights of uh, the, the, the workers. He's a great advocate and a specialist of the Thai fishing industry, so we will speak of that. And to moderate them, we have Ben Skinner, that I think we don't need to present. Uh, ben Skinner has been also, like Martina Vandenberg, almost at all my conferences. Uh, he's, he's, yeah. Uh, he, he, is, um, he is today the CEO of a very interesting organization called uh, Transparentum. He created it. I am on his board to avoid uh, all conflict of interest. Transparentum, uh, maybe you will say a few words about it, but it, it is approaching mm -hmm. the, the, the issue of the supply chain in, uh, in a way that could only come to the brain of an ex-investigative journalist. Uh, ben, I leave it to you. Let me thank you. Um, and thank you all for uh, sticking around on a, uh, 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 on a lovely afternoon to ponder over the deeds of darkness here. Um, so um, I, I'm going to talk very, very briefly, and then I'll shut up because we have a very interesting uh, panel uh, that speaks with uh, far more heft, um, not only uh, by virtue of their intellect, but also by virtue of their market cap. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, to start out, I want to say um, the reason why Transparentum focuses on the private sector, uh, and we are a discrete nonprofit intelligence unit that uses frontline reporting ethics and forensic methods to understand supply chains, to understand where slavery, environmental degradation, uh, uh, crimes against humanity, corruption, uh, fall upstream in corporate supply chains. The reason we focus on supply chains and the reason we focus on the downstream 
actors, the brands, the retailers, uh, is because there has been a shift in, uh, in might in the world uh, uh, that has been fairly pronounced since the end of World War II, but has accelerated uh, over the last five years. Five years ago, half of the world's 175 largest economic entities were corporations. Today, that percentage is north of, of 70%. So what we're talking about here is a significant shift of economic might away from nation states and towards private corporations and towards public corporations as well. Um, so uh, uh, when we think about how to eradicate problems uh, like we saw this afternoon so, uh, so poignantly illustrated with the, the voices of the advocates, when we think about how to do that, we have to think first and foremost about how to enlist corporate might. So here with us today, we have um, uh, two uh, uh, representatives of the beating heart of corporations. Um, uh, these two corporations put together, uh, uh, their market cap represents uh, more than the uh, 2016 GDP of Bangladesh. Um, so think about that for a moment in terms of clout, in terms of, uh, in terms of leverage. Um, um, and I, I, I want to begin with you, uh, Aditi, and, and I want to talk about how uh, Adidas does uh, uh, in terms of uh, understanding its supply chain. Uh, there was a, a report issued by Know the Chain, which is a Humanity United initiative, which ranked uh, all of the apparel retailers, uh, or the, the, uh, many of the top apparel retailers uh, and brands. Uh, and Adidas was at the top. Um, at the same time, the, 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 the numeric score was 81 out of 100. That's not bad, but it's not 100. Um, how can you do better? What, what, what can you do more? How can you better understand where you're having an effect on, on slavery? Sure. Thank you for that. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So uh, for us at Adidas, uh, you know, placing uh, human rights risks and its potential adverse impact on people, it's really at the center of what we do. So uh, this is to fulfill a basic obligation as a responsible business. So we're not really seeking perfect scores. Having said that, uh, being ranked number one on a benchmark like this allows us to do two things. <clears throat> one is it allows us to reflect on potential gaps in our policies and practices. And second, it allows us to understand what stakeholders expect from us. Um, now, looking for child labor, forced labor, modern slavery practices is not new for Adidas. Uh, we've been doing it for 20 years now uh, with a fairly forensic eye, if I may. And we will continue to do that uh, through our direct monitoring of our supply chain and also through what we call the Modern Slavery Outreach Program, which is something we launched last year, which is what I manage for Adidas. Uh, and over the years of sort of doing this work, what we have found and what everybody has heard a million times before is that preventing or identifying to begin with, identifying, preventing, mitigating human rights risks is extremely complex, it's challenging, it's resource intensive, and it really demands an expertise and an outreach coupled with a lot of perseverance. Mm. So aligned with this approach, we actually are now extending our, uh, our forensic eye to the extended supply chain, which is really our tier two processing facilities and <clears throat> tier three raw material sources. And uh, I believe that our increased or our, our push for transparency and disclosure has actually led us to receive this positive score. Um, but going forward, what, what can we do? What will we do? Mm. We will need to find newer ways of working as we go further down the chain. Uh, the same principles that we apply at Tier 1 cannot be used for Tier 2, and especially Tier 3, where the leverage is very, very limited. Uh, and I'll just conclude with an example. Uh, leather is a raw material that is used in our products mm. and the economic impact really of our leather purchasing last year was 
0.03%. Mm. So you're talking about a drop in the ocean sourcing footprint and therefore mm. a very tiny leverage to bring about change. Having said that, we are extremely motivated to work with stakeholders and address potential exploitative practices that may occur in the leather supply chain, especially in countries like Brazil and Paraguay, which we've identified as high-risk countries. Mm -hmm. And to conclude, uh, really to answer your question, can we do better? I think all of us can and should, and uh, there are 45.8 million reasons that are pointing us in that direction. So. Sure. Um, Doug, uh, uh, you have a, again, by, by market cap, $127 uh, billion dollar, uh, uh, company, um, uh, a tremendous amount of influence, uh, thousands of suppliers. Um, uh, how do you police uh, such a diffuse spend, um, uh, and what do you do when you find problem suppliers? What's, where's the line between cutting and running, and remediating. So let, let me, uh, first of all, just thank Monique for inviting Walmart to speak, uh, and Thomson Reuters. Um, and I particularly like the, the title, Trust Conference. Um, it, it aligns with a goal of Walmart this year, which is to be the most trusted retailer. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also aligns with an issue that I think is one of the hearts of, of what's needed in this whole space of collaboration. Um, you know, and I, I can talk about more about that later, but just the idea that stakeholders that are collaborating need to trust each other more. Uh, that's kind of in a, in a nutshell. But let me, let me, to answer your question, let me just kind of put some context to it. You've already mentioned the size of Walmart, but let me elaborate. Um, 500, almost 500 billion in, in revenues, um, the largest company by that standard in the world. Mm. We, have, we are the largest private employer uh, in the world with 2.3 million associates worldwide, 1.5 million in the U.S. Um, we have over 11,500 stores worldwide uh, under 63 different banners. So that's the names of the stores. Uh, and then that's in 28 different countries uh, around the world, um, many of which are actually outside of the U.S. Uh, and so if you take, take that and then imagine all the products that are for sale in those stores, and then you understand the complexity of the supply chain that underlies that, um, that, that we deal with. And, and that's not to mention the, the e-commerce websites that we have in 10 different countries as well, or the acquisitions we just had of, of Jet.com and ModCloth and ShoeBuy and MooseJaw and uh, hay needle. Uh, so, so take all that together and you kind of get a picture of what you see and then underneath it is the supply chain supplying all those products. So with that complexity, take the complexity of, of the issue that we're dealing with, which is uh, modern slavery. Uh, where is it? How do you find it? Indicators for it? It's, it's a complex issue. Mm. Um, and, and so when you, when you ask, um, you know, cutting and running you know, when you find the issues, the issues, you know, we, we, have a, we have a program around the world. Our department has associates around the world that are located in the retail markets which we serve. And those associates are uh, looking at audit reports. They're, they're reviewing them. They're working with suppliers. They're working with buyers. They're um, looking for these issues. They're investigating issues. Um, so all that information comes in. And if there is an issue, we, we, we deal with it uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. And uh, you have to ask a lot of questions to make the decision, do you cut and run or do you actually continue to work? Uh, it, you know, some of the factors that you have to take into account are the country, the factory, the supplier. Are we talking deceit? Are we talking one time? Is this a one-off thing? Uh, what, what's at stake here? And... Um, and a good example of where we had to deal with that is, is in Bangladesh. Um, you know, yesterday was the fourth anniversary of Rana Plaza. And, uh, and in the wake of that, in the Tazreen fire, we, we focused and, and had to come to a decision. Do we cut and run or not mm -hmm. in Bangladesh when it comes to apparel? Uh, 
and the sourcing that we were doing in, in the country. And others chose to actually cut and run uh, other brands. Mm -hmm. But we chose to stay and, and invest in the infrastructure uh, through uh, the Alliance for Bangladesh Workers' Safety, uh, collaborating with others, bringing them together to the table, trying to work with the government. Uh, we hired civil engineers in Dhaka to, to work with the factories, to educate them on how to install fire safety equipment, uh, structural things. Uh, so, and, and there's been a lot of progress, mm. I believe, uh, in, and there's a lot more yet to be done. But, but in that decision, we decided to use the size of Walmart for good in a, in a country uh, that we felt we could try to make an impact. Uh, so, so um, first of all, correcting the record, I think I understated uh, Walmart's market cap by about $100 billion. <laughs> but what's a, what's a, well, mark, what's market cap billion versus revenue, right? So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, um, uh, narrowing in on seafood for a second, um, because uh, this is where we've sort of, uh, I've crossed paths with Walmart in the past. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I did a, a story in 2012 for a publication that shall not be named um, uh, that, uh, Brian from Bloomberg, um, uh, that, that focused on slavery in, uh, in the fishing industry. Um, and uh, when, when we began sort of tugging on the thread, we found slavery in a place that, frankly, nobody expected, or we didn't expect to find it at first, which was New Zealand, in the exclusive economic zone around New Zealand. Um, and when we began uh, tracking where this seafood was going, uh, uh, a whole range of companies that, uh, frankly, uh, we, we, find, we found credible, they didn't know where it was coming from, um, uh, 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 showed up on our transom, uh, uh, on our radar. Um, uh, that included uh, Sam's Club. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so in, in acute situations like that, um, where you have a very specific population um, that has been uh, uh, exploited in that case by uh, uh, by recruiters, um, by Indonesian recruiters, and then abused by Korean uh, officers on board these vessels. Um, uh, uh, and this abuse was uh, uh, verbal; it was physical, and uh, uh, in many cases, it was sexual as well uh, as a means to subjugate the the, the, the crews. Um, what responsibility do the end use Customers have to the to the to the buyers have in a situation like that, uh, and, and I ask very much, you know, with an eye to companies like Patagonia mm -hmm. that have gone in and, and seen, okay, our Taiwanese uh, uh, textile manufacturers are, uh, are are using these this system of debt bondage. Let's get our arms around this. Well, let's work with Verite. Let's um, let's reimburse these workers. Mm -hmm. um, again. In acute situations like that, what do you do? So I can't speak to the New Zealand issue as before my time at Walmart, um, but we had a similar issue, obviously, with the Guardian article that came out on um, seafood in Thailand uh, in 2014. And, and in situations like that, we still we, we look to to seek to address some of the the factors that are causing the problem. Um, Walmart, one thing it's good at is systems change and, and actually influencing the, the infrastructure around things. And so, like, for example, with the seafood in Thailand, which started with the shrimp, again, understanding the complexity of this, uh, you know, you had the, the illegal, unregulated boats catching the fish, selling the bycatch to, uh, to a, uh, a f fish meal mm -hmm. uh, supplier who supplied it then to the feed mill. The feed mill then sold it to the, the hatchery for the shrimp. The shrimp hatchery then sold it to the, to the farm who raised it, who then sold it to the processing plant, who then sold it to Walmart. I mean, it's, it's five levels below mm. what we actually have a contract with. Mm. We have a contract with that processing plant or whoever sells it to us. Yeah. And so in situations like that, we have to look at how do we get everybody involved that's in this problem, in the issue, and so, for example, we worked with the, forming the Seafood Task Force, which used to be called the Sust Shrimp Sustainable Supply Chain Task Force. Um, bring together the, the right people to the table, the stakeholders involved, uh, with, and that involves business as well as 
uh, NGOs and advisory groups. And then discuss it, figure out a plan of action and work together um, to come up with a solution. Because I mean, you can address the one-offs, but you've got to address the, the whole structure and the infrastructure around it. And in that situation, we, we also did others. We went a little further uh, and have looked for innovative ways to address issues in Thailand. For example, with the Itzara Institute, a grant that we made to them, where, where they've now developed an app uh, for a phone called Golden Dreams, which is a Burmese language app that the Burmese workers can use to actually communicate about good, good recruiters, bad recruiters, employers, services, and things like that. Uh, and then we also funded um, IGM, International Justice Mission, to go in and do a study of what was going on, investigate some of these allegations of forced labor, and they've, they've looked at five hot spots in the Thai Gulf area, uh, and then we're going to continue to work with them to actually identify, to investigate further, uh, and then also to, to remediate and, and work with these victims and get them into aftercare services, as well as uh, working alongside the government to try to help the government find the gaps where they're not enforcing their own laws against these human traffickers uh, and those that are, that are responsible. And then there's more to it than that. We're involved with uh, responsible recruitment is a big issue for us. We've committed to the employer pays principle that uh, no, that the employer should pay for the costs of recruitment fees, mm -hmm. not the migrant worker. Uh, so we're, we're involved with the leadership group for responsible recruitment um, out of uh, with some other brands that's underwritten by the Institute for Human Rights and Business, business and, um, and seeking to implement that in, into our supply chain. Uh, in the best way possible. Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, Thailand and fishing, uh, two areas that Andy, uh, I think you know quite a bit about. Um, <laughs> uh, you uh, have led for the cause, uh, and I know many of us uh, were uh, tracking your welfare uh, as best we could uh, with a, with a uh, no small amount of trepidation, uh, but also a great deal of admiration for how you handled yourself. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, and um, so um, let me ask you somewhat provocatively, uh, is, is Walmart doing enough uh, uh, on seafood? Um, is uh, Adidas doing enough on apparel? Uh, and and uh, critically, um, who, is, who is really responsible for addressing the scourge? And, and I want to add to that, who is responsible for the restitution and the rehabilitation of those that are victimized? Um, I think it's important to go back and look at the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. It's very important. And I think the key actors in all of this are, are the governments and the, and the corporations. Uh, they are the people who have the duty and the responsibility to address these issues in their supply chains, because they are supply chains that they've created. Um, and they've taken around the world to many places. Workers have left their home countries and uh, gone to other countries. Um, people have migrated from the villages to come into these supply chains. And I think it's clear that the companies and the, the governments have to be responsible. And I think if we look at the situation today and we look at the situation five years ago, even two years ago, we have to give credit to the improvements that have happened. You know? When I was looking, preparing for this panel, I looked at Adidas's 150 page um, standards, you know, I looked at Walmart standards, I looked at the commitments, I looked at their role in the responsible recruitment initiatives, you know, both of the companies are looking at recruitment issues. Um, but it's clear that there's a lot more that needs to be done, um, and it is their duty to do that, and they should be held responsible to do that. I think that both the governments and also or origin countries, when we have migrant workers, they have a lot of responsibility that they've yet to fulfil, so there's so much more that needs to be done. But I think that when I talk about, I focus on migrant worker issues at the moment, um, I think that we have this issue of recruitment. So as somebody who worked in Thailand for 11 years on, on recruitment issues, responsible recruitment is, is the key to a lot of the abuse that migrant workers are facing. And this is the key to the fishing industry. If we look at the situation between Thailand, Cambodia and Myanmar today, there's still no formal channel for workers to come into fishing boats, into the fishing industry in Thailand. It doesn't exist until today. 
And what we've seen is workers coming in in situations of debt bondage, you know. Once they're in the country, and we heard from the, from the survivors today, that they can't escape from that situation. Until today, and again, we have to give credit to Walmart for its leadership role. They're, they're part of the, the, the global um, leadership uh, group on responsible recruitment. But all of their supply chains in Thailand, and we're talking about first tier, all the workers are still paying for their jobs to come into the country. There is no policy from Walmart to ensure this employer pays. And that's something which is in the, in the pipeline. Right. It's being right. done. Mm. It's not something that can easily be done. But there's such a long way to go. You know, we're working now with Thai Union, uh, the Migrant Worker Rights Network. We have a project on zero recruitment service fees. So we are the first, the Thai Union is the first company to implement that. We're having huge problems implementing that policy between Myanmar and Cambodia and Thailand because of the corruption, the systematic corruption, and because of the fact that the employers don't see that it's their responsibility to pay these costs. Mm. So we can say that, and we're just talking about first tier, you know, and I know Adidas, again, I don't have a lot of experience, but I know that most of the garment workers who are coming from overseas into Thailand, from Cambodia, from Myanmar, they're still paying recruitment fees. And whether there's a, an employer pays principle or not, the workers are still paying, and that creates a real situation of debt bondage. What we also see, if we look at recruitment, we also look at worker empowerment. So we see that many of the policies of the, of the companies, they're still not empowering workers to speak out. They're still not ensuring respect for freedom of association, collective bargaining. That is a big problem. You know, we're seeing an increase in worker applications, worker hotlines, consultants, civil society projects that are not empowering workers. And without workers being empowered, there is no sustainable solution. Mm. We can't have a debate about... We can't have a debate about the living wage without workers being empowered. They need to be empowered, they need to organise. And that is something we're not seeing enough support from. We look at the remedy issue, and again, I think Nestlé is trying its best in, in many things that they've done. But they came out with a report last year with Verite saying we have slavery in our supply chains. We admit that we have slavery in our supply chains. And I met them at a conference in London last year, and I said to them, well, it's great that you acknowledge that there's slavery in your supply chain." So how are you remedying it? How are you remedying all this slavery that you acknowledge is in your supply chain? Whether it be Nestle, whether it be Walmart, whether it be any of these seafood companies. There is no remedy being provided to workers in Thailand. The workers, this is now a huge international topic of Thailand and seafood. But we see day in, day out in our office, the workers have no remedy. They have no means to access a remedy. And that is something that is, is, is a big problem. Mm. Thai Union have tried to set up, we, we had the initiative with the... Um, with the trust conference um, in, in December, Thailand announced that they were going to set up this trust fund, uh, or they were going to pioneer this trust fund to, to, to remedy victims of seafood slavery. Until today, five months later, there's been no progress in that. And Thai Union is saying that the buyers are not committed to, into that fund. So I think that the responsibility to remedy, uh, it is with the companies, mm -hmm. and it is with the suppliers, and we're just not seeing any remedies. And, and in a world where now we have a, a market full of civil society organisations, funded by USAID, funded by the UK government. We have so many civil societies in, in Thailand working on, remedy, uh, working on seafood, but we see that the workers are not getting any remedies, and that is a big issue that needs to be addressed. So, um, uh, Doug, I want to let you respond on the Thai <laughs> fees question uh, in, in a second, but one more question for you, Andy. Um, uh, how can downstream consumer-facing brands and retailers uh, do more to empower worker voice? Um, to, uh, to make sure that uh, whistleblowers uh, uh, who are, uh, whether they're blowing the whistle about environmental uh, degradation or safety conditions like at Rana Plaza or, uh, or uh, slavery, how can they be protected better by brands and retailers? Um, I think my case was, was something that I guess was a case where it was I always like to think of it as a very dark cloud which had a silver lining, you know. Mm. So when I was prosecuted, uh, I had to try and find a way for this case to be positive, you know. I was convicted, I was sentenced to prison, it was a suspended sentence, I faced new prosecutions in Thailand, but I, I tried to think what is it positive that has come out of this case. Mm. And I think there's many, many things that have came out, you know. When I first was prosecuted, I refused to pay the bail, and I refused to, 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 to be subject to this justice system, and, and to the credit you know, we had companies. So when I was convicted, when I had the fine, when I was, um, sent, uh, when I was uh, indicted and I had to pay bail, 
It was companies that paid the bail. It was Thai Union. It was the Thai Tuna Industry Association. It was the Thai Frozen Food Association. Mm -hmm. So we had companies coming forward and supporting me on a symbolic level mm -hmm. because I felt that what was important from my case is to show that there are good actors and there are bad actors. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is bad. Not everyone is irrational. Mm -hmm. To go after a human rights defender is not a rational thing to do mm -hmm. in this era. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't look good for your company. So mm -hmm. I tried to make it clear that there were good companies who were there to support. Yeah. And when I had my trial, uh, there was testimony from S Group, one of the main uh, Finnish um, uh, uh, retailers. There was mm. testimony from the seafood industry to say that my work was important, to say that mm. what I was doing was very important. But I think when, again, I want to go back to when I was uh, in Strasbourg back in October, the European Parliament, they, they passed a resolution on my case condemning the conviction and saying that this was a real chilling impact on worker leaders, on union leaders, on human rights activists, on researchers across the world. Seeing me convicted would be something that would make people feel really uncomfortable about standing up and fighting. Mm -hmm. And I met with Cecilia Malmström, who is the EU Trade Commissioner, and we had a long talk and she said she supported me and she made a passionate uh, plea you know, in the European Parliament that she was supporting. And she said, what is it that I can do for you, Andy, to support people in your position? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what's most important for me is transparency of supply chain. There needs to be transparency in supply chains. There needs to be information online about where companies are sourcing. You know, this can be something that can provide help to people who are worker leaders, migrant leaders, activists, researchers. If we have the transparency, so we have the factory lists online, we have that information online, we don't need to put ourselves in situations whereby we have to fight alone or workers have to be alone, they have to fight alone. We can contact uh, corporations like Walmart like Adidas, you know, for instance, Adidas, when you go online, you will see where their factories are in Thailand, you know. So you can, you can contact the company, you can, you can use these, these remedy mechanisms to get um, some kind of remedy for the workers or mm -hmm. to get some kind of pressure on the companies. If we want to know where Walmart is sourcing, it's very difficult to find that information at the moment. And that's not just Walmart, that's the whole seafood industry because they only just got... Uh, traceability in their supply chain. So it's very difficult for them to have transparency. So I think that the, the thing that we need from, from companies, the things that we need is we need transparent supply chains. If we have transparent supply chains, we can use those mechanisms and that will reduce the risk on us as human rights defenders to be able to defend the workers and to be able to enhance their rights in the workplace by having that leverage of being able to engage with companies. And then investigative journalists can also do their own work. Other people can access that information. Doug, I am going to come back to you, but first um, to you, Aditi. Um, on that question of, of transparent supply chains, uh, one thing that uh, investigators encounter all the time is the word proprietary um, when we're trying to understand different sourcing relationships. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if I'm alone in, in my belief that that is the single most overused term. I can understand how in certain costing negotiations, uh, the actual price of product would be proprietary. But uh, understanding who buys what from whom uh, seems to me to be, among other things, a product safety issue. It seems to me, uh, uh, in some cases, a national security issue. Um, uh, uh, tell me why I'm wrong. You know, this is the first time I'm, I'm hearing the word proprietary. Ah. First time. Well, that's really? good. You work at a different type of company then. You know, so uh, you'll have to actually reframe that question mm. for me, mm. you know, because uh, I haven't, I actually haven't understood your question. So, well, the, uh, let, let me reframe it then. Um, oftentimes, we will try to understand uh, everybody who a certain supplier sells to. If we, if we go to that supplier uh, uh, and we try to get a sense of what product was shipped when, um, and in what quantities, um, we oftentimes hit that word, and that word is like a wall. Um, uh, and there isn't, a ne there isn't necessarily a legal justification for it. Mm -hmm. um, there's supposedly a business justification for it. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying that you've never heard it, never. Then, then... No, but also, you know, um, you have to understand that our supply chain uh, mm. is fairly consolidated. I mean, we're fortunate. Mm. Uh, I mean, we also source... To put it in context, 64 countries, 1.3 million workers. Yeah. Uh, but 80% of where our product comes from is from 107 primary factories. And are, and are these nominated at Tier 2? Tier 1 and Tier 2. And so, Tier, two. And tier okay. 2. So, for example, I think we're one of the few companies where we nominate exactly which tanneries can sell to Tier 1s. And we, we do not permit Tier 1 
suppliers to uh, purchase from anybody else. Mm. So the level of transparency is fairly high. Mm. Um, and responding to what you said, Andy, uh, tier, uh, tier one lists are publicly disclosed. Mm. Tier two lists are also publicly disclosed. Mm. We have also disclosed the material flows at the tier three level. Mm -hmm. So having this level of consolidation really allows us to, to, to have that control and uh, to then identify. It's easier to identify and fix risks. Mm. Um, and I want to also just allude to the human rights defenders uh, piece, which we believe at Adidas is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we support. And I think we're one of the three companies in the world that actually has a human rights defenders policy. It's publicly mm -hmm. listed. I was uh, told uh, that uh, Marks and Spencer's and Haynes Brands also does, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Uh, so these are very positive indicators, you know, yeah. and I think more and more companies should sort of learn from this. Uh, and we actually then also petition governments uh, where we found human rights defenders to be, you know, uh, prosecuted or and there are examples from Vietnam China all of this publicly listed uh, sometimes I joke with my boss saying that our sustainability uh, site on the website is so crowded mm. because there is so much information out mm. there which is a great thing mm. So. Mm. well and, and it may go uh, the fact that the word proprietary um, sounds like a four-letter word at uh, uh, Adidas that probably <laughs> goes a long way towards explaining why you're top of the list of know the chains rankings um, in terms of nominating tier two suppliers, where is Walmart on that? Or at least mapping tier two suppliers? Well, we've got, we, so, so we have direct sourcing mm. where, you know, it's a private label, private brand. In that instance, you know, we try to um, impress really on that supplier, this is what we need as far as um, how to produce that product. And so in those instances, you'll have more uh, interaction at where where the tier two is going to be. Mm. Um, domestic suppliers, uh, a little bit less. Mm. Um, you know that that's going to be also though we rely on some of those suppliers to actually do some of that work themselves. Like mm. um, you know the P and Gs, the Unilevers um, of the world that sell products in our stores are actually doing some of that work. I want to let you respond on the on the question on uh, what. Andy raised about the, the Thai fees, mm -hmm. um, because I think that's a really important uh, question. And uh, what's Walmart doing to, uh, to make that situation a little more safe? Right, right. Well, I, I agree with Andy. Um, <laughs> hopefully that's not a bad thing to get, you know, more controversy. But I, I, ag I agree that, you know, we just came to the employer pays principle last November. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we just committed to that. And... Rather than just turn the faucet on or turn it off or whatever, however you want to call it, on every supplier, which can be like a whack-a-mole, you know, you hit this and it pops up over here, and we, we wanted to implement it in a controlled way. Mm. And so that's what we're trying to do is, is look for partners, look for ways that we can actually do it. Where, where can we make a difference? And then learn from that and go out from there. Mm. Uh, and that's through the leadership group. It's through... Um, work that we're doing with others to try to professionalize the recruitment industry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, working, talking with uh, organizations like IOM has an IRIS program. Mm -hmm. uh, David Camp in the UK has Clearview. Uh, and then the Fair Hanger Initiative is, is working with the ICC. So, so these are all organizations that are trying to professionalize the industry and certify those labor providers. To, so, you, so you can tell who's the good ones and who's the bad ones. Yeah. Because it's, a, it's an economic problem, mm -hmm. you know, in, the, in that whole sourcing of labor from one country to another. And so we're trying to affect the demand, mm -hmm. you know, at the supplier level. Say, you know, you should, you should pay for those that, are, for the, that come to you mm -hmm. because often the, the factories aren't paying for that service mm -hmm. of, of the recruiter bringing the, the labor to them. And then we're trying to affect the supply of it you know, so that the supply of ethically recruited labor goes up. Yeah. Uh, and then we're also trying to affect that with the government, too. Now, um, another thing that Andy raised uh, was the question of protecting whistleblowers. And obviously, um, Andy, uh, I, I know you didn't seek to be, but you were a bit of a cause celeb. Um, uh, uh, 
so many of the whistleblowers in these situations don't have the benefit of an international campaign behind them. Mm. Um, and many of them, and I've seen this uh, in my own work, uh, are, are today can't speak for themselves because they've disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what can Walmart do? And I know you have a hotline, at least on, uh, uh, on workplace safety uh, and issues like this. Um, uh, does that hotline also extend to uh, issues of fraudulent recruitment, trafficking fees, et cetera, et cetera, where yes. workers can call in and be protected? Yeah, it's, it's a general ethics hotline. Mm. So it could be any of those issues, yeah. um, not just one. And, 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 and what are the policies in place when trafficking is uncovered in a, in a situation like that? So if, if an allegation comes in through the hotline, it gets investigated. Mm -hmm. um, investigators around the world in Bentonville look into the allegations uh, and, and then try to determine the validity of them or, or the invalidity. Got it. And then, and then you, you deal with it as a case by case. What do we do with this yeah. uh, information now? And do we terminate the supplier? Do we work with the supplier? Do we educate the supplier? We have programs to, to actually run them through training and try to educate them. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it something that involves deception? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that we can actually change just by talking to them and educating them? Now, Walmart's also partnered with uh, organizations that do social outreach on the ground, such as BRAC, I believe, right. in, in the past, right? Um, I mean, there's an organization, largest non-governmental organization in the world, um, that can actually do outreach to those workers. Um, is there, is there a, a, an effort, a practice, a policy um, to, to reach out to those workers with, with some degree of, of help, of, of potential protection? Um, what I'm struck by, and I was struck by this in the, in the earlier panel, um, you know, for, for millions of workers, these, these first-tier jobs uh, in, a, in a garment factory or a, a, on a fishing vessel, uh, that's the first step on the ladder out of absolute poverty. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe they're exploited in, in, in one, one area, but they still need a job. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you make sure that that transition is, uh, is a safe one for them? from a, a, a situation of exploitation to a situation of safe and dignified work? So I, I hear two parts in your question. One is, you know, because you can have an issue come up and the person still work at the, at the factory, for example. Mm. And, and a good example, I think, if you haven't looked at the Alliance hotline, the Amadeir Kota, um, it's been extremely successful, not just for safety. Mm -hmm. uh, people call that for anything, and uh, there's been lots of calls. Um, and, and in that instance, I think they've done a good job of, of working with the workers and helping to empower them to actually speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, more than anybody expected. Uh, and you can go on to the Alliance Bangladesh Worker Safety, uh, the Alliance for Bangladesh hot, uh, website and see the, uh, the results of it. Mm -hmm. um, then the second part that I hear you is like the, somebody that's a victim that now is not in that situation anymore and, and, and is in need of help. Um, you know, that's where, for example, we're, we're partnering with International Justice Mission to, to take some of those victims in Thailand mm. uh, and then work with them and provide some aftercare services. Mm. So. Um, Andy, what have you seen uh, for best practice on, uh, in the industries and the geographies that you've been working in terms of that, in terms of that aftercare? Um, I can give the example of uh, Hewlett Packard. So we uh, we had a case in Thailand recently, uh, which uh, until today didn't go public. Um, but we had a big case where they have a very strong migrant worker policy, uh, and they have a very strong zero recruitment service fee policy. And they have a uh, a company in Thailand which employs I think up to 15,000 migrant workers. And and they were not directly employed; they were employed through brokers and agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were paying very high recruitment fees. Uh, and there was a lot of exploitation. We contacted uh, Hewlett Packard through our networks, and within weeks they launched an, uh, uh, a whole um, investigation. And they provided a remedy to the workers. They provided a very strong remedy to the workers. They gave the money back to the workers. Mm -hmm. They gave the documents back to the workers. And I think that was a really good this practice. Why they yeah. the stuff so I think that that was a, a very good practice um, that we saw in Thailand. Um, we also see uh, Thai Union is obviously uh, the center of a very big campaign now by Greenpeace and other organizations. But we're working with Thai Union because we see that they're committed to trying to bring change. Of course, they're in a very 
uh, good position to bring change. They have a very big company and they have a lot of uh, market share and they have a lot of profit. Mm. Um, we see them looking at issues of zero recruitment service fees, uh, which is very good. They allowed myself and MWO into their workplace. Uh, we're working on a social dialogue project with them. Mm -hmm. um, I think also we have to be careful, and again, I hear a lot these days about empowerment of workers and workers being able to speak up, being associated with hotlines. You know, it's very different way of thinking for me. You know, I find hotlines actually to be very disempowering. Yeah. You know, workers have a problem, they ring a hotline, someone fixes it, and then actually the information in that hotline is actually a property that's sold by, for instance, some social enterprise or some NGO to a company, and they have a non-disclosure agreement. So we have these hotlines being like privatised. That is not worker empowerment. You know, the fact that workers can contact an application or contact a hotline and complain, and then their problem is solved. Yeah, it is providing a voice in the sense of audits also provide a voice, and, and we support audits. We think audits are very important. They can provide workers with a voice where there is no voice. You know, where they don't have trade unions. Good audits. You know, good audits. Yeah, when they're done properly, yeah. when they have triangulation, when they look at workers' conditions, they go and interview workers in there. Uh, in their homes, you know, they, they speak to civil society organisations, they look at these issues very carefully, they can give a voice, hotlines can give a voice, yeah. applications can give a voice, but that can't take the place of worker organising, you know, and in Thailand what we see now, and again, we have to go back to this task force that was set up, and I think this task force at Walmart was a very important role, they set up a seafood task force, until today there is no local civil society organisation that has ever been engaged by that task force in any significant way, mm. it is just companies, and it is just international NGOs. You know, Verite is involved, WWF is involved, Oxfam is involved. But they have never consulted, you know. In fact, they asked us to go and give five-minute presentations to their executives who'd flown in from the US, who'd flown in from England, you know. And that is not worker empowerment, you know. Worker empowerment is listening to the local grassroots communities, but also empowering the workers to be able to speak up. And I think that we have to say, in Thailand, there really is no practice because the migrant workers in Thailand are as quiet today as what they always have been. You know, we bought a case recently with 2,243 workers in a tuna factory that is supplying. You know, Bumblebee is a shareholder in that company. Mm. You know, we have many companies in Thailand, that are in, in the US, that are buying from that company. This collective organising by the workers was allegedly suppressed. You know, mm. and we haven't seen the response from the buyers to that. So I think there really isn't that much good practice in really empowering workers, and that's something that needs to be focused on for the future. And that, and that accrues to a general uh, resistance to transparency, I suppose, in these, in these industries. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, of course. I mean, a lot of the things that are being done now in the seafood, for instance, and again, we understand, well, I understand within the Thai context there's this new tariff, you know, the tariff act in, 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 the, in the United States, you know, and if companies know about slavery and they don't do things and they can be prosecuted, you know, I, actually I was quite disappointed. You know, I've been in Washington the last few days and I, I really felt that this was kind of a beacon of hope, this tariff, tariff act, you know, and I thought, wow, this is a really good mechanism that can be used. And when I actually got here and spoke to officials and spoke to the, the Homeland Securities Department, I mean, it's almost never used and it's almost impossible to bring a case uh, against a company under this tariff act to actually get something seized and to get companies you know, held liable. Yeah. Um, but I think that a lot of the stuff that's being done these days is being done very non-transparently. You know? yeah. It's being done through hotlines, it's being done through non-disclosure agreements and I think there needs to be more that's done publicly. For instance, if you look at HP, if you look at some of the other companies, um, if you look at some of the garment industry initiatives, the complaint mechanisms are all online. So when someone makes a complaint, for instance, to the Fairware Foundation in Amsterdam, that complaint goes online and then people can see what was done to remedy that complaint. And I think that kind of thing is needs, needs to be done. It doesn't need to be done behind closed doors because it is not, it's not really uh, giving voice to the, the, the remedy that needs to be seen to be done also. Uh, we have about 25 minutes left and two microphones. Um, if people could uh, begin lining up, I just want to give you a second, Doug, to respond to the, to the hotline issue because I think it's an important question. How do you balance... Um, anonymity and protection of the of those that are calling into the hotlines with general transparency of where the where the issues are. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult issue to 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 try to work out. Uh, you know, and I understand the concerns, and I I hear that um, you know as well. Mm. You know, you, they need some privacy um, as well. I mean, that's mm. another issue. You know, whether right. they actually uh, are protected. Uh, and, um, and so how do you work that out? And then how do you work it out from the, the position we're in where, you know, HP is actually our supplier? <laughs> and so they're closer to the issue, issue than we are. Uh, or, you know, so 
you know, at, at our level, we've got to work with those that are on the ground, like like Andy and, and others, to to try to do that. Got it. Um, we'll start up here on the left. Please uh, identify yourself. Hi, my name is Sorgi Chen from Thomson Reuters. I have a quick question about transparency on supply chain. Um, what kind of technology and or data resources do you currently are currently available to companies to gain more insights around the kind of vendors you're dealing with globally? And uh, what more uh, could, would you need in order to kind of have the level of transparency that you want to have? When you say numbers, do you mean incidents of trafficking? Do you mean Just um, when I product? say like information and technology resources to gain more insights around, like, you know, let's say you're having a partnership or you're um, sourcing, like, you know, recruiting or working with vendors, like, um, in other countries or here in the state, you want to make sure that they are not using slaves and, how, you know, what kind of, do you have any currently, like, technology or data resources available to you to do almost like a background check and more um, to, to make sure that you, they're clean, that they're, um, they're, you know, ethical. Yeah, yeah, okay. good, great. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, and I will use it in the context of the worker voice because, like I already explained, uh, we have a fair amount of visibility right from, you know, the upstream suppliers to tier one. But technology is something that we use with, uh, and contrary to what you're saying in terms of, uh, you know, I don't know when you meant hotlines, did you mean like the call-in line? Because we found using... Um, Companies like Labor Voice, Micro Benefits, Workplace Options, these are all partners that we work with. And they have provided uh, and they've created these uh, smartphone applications. So China, for example, where the majority of the workers uh, use smartphones, they can actually download an app and uh, use that to check their wages, use that to get trained and most importantly, use that to express a concern or a grievance or actually point out issues around slavery if and when they exist. Uh, this application is available, I mean, or this, this methodology, whether it's, so China uses smartphones, uh, but in Cambodia, because the literacy uh, rates are lower, we've had to use the SMS technology. So we're also looking at different countries, cultural contexts, and what will work and what won't work. And currently about 300,000 workers have access to this technology uh, and are able to, you know, uh, it really gives them a voice and it gives us data from ground up because then we can actually correct issues. And I'll conclude by something that really disturbed me last week. I was on a call with our provider in Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, we're doing this um, <clears throat> through an IVR system. So the worker calls in uh, and has two options. One is to actually respond uh, to a set of uh, questions around forced labor, child labor, and so on, and also has an option to leave a voice recording. And uh, we're doing this with our tier two suppliers, uh, even though our sourcing footprint, again, in Turkey is really, really small. Mm. Uh, it is because of the Syrian refugee crisis. We want to understand what working conditions are like. And uh, the, 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 the statistics were very, very disturbing, you know. Uh, small numbers, but even if one person calls in, that's enough. And mm. that... And that has actually triggered, uh, uh, I won't use the word audit, but we're actually going to go in and do an unscheduled visit in the night because somebody actually called in and said, there are children here in the factory mm. or there are uh, workers from Turkmenistan, you know, who are illegal. Uh, so using technology uh, has really given us an advantage in actually unearthing these issues. You use the word forensic earlier when you were describing the way um, you understand your supply chains. And that was very interesting to me because um, one thing that I see across industries um, is uh, an understanding that suppliers are independent, sovereign, uh, uh, that um, uh, if there is an audit done, it's, it has to be done fully uh, with the buy-in of that uh, particular supplier. And there, there may be some le legal justification for that. but. Um, you oftentimes run into what economists call the agency problem, where uh, the, the auditors, particularly if they're paid by the suppliers, are not particularly interested in finding a whole bunch of information yeah. that is going to hurt that supplier with their 
with their buyers. Um, so how do you address that? Who pays for the audits of your first-year suppliers? So it's a mix. The suppliers pay. Sometimes mm -hmm. we pay. But what's interesting is that for our tier one, we have a team of 70 people, mm -hmm. uh, experts really. The average tenure would be, I don't know, eight years, ten years. And the way we're structured is we have a monitoring team that goes in and does these audits. And the audit is not a typical checklist. It differs uh, depending on the process. So the way we would audit an apparel supplier or a business partner would be different from the way we would audit a hard goods uh, business mm -hmm. partner. So that's one. And uh, it's done in-house. It's done by our own team. And then we have what we call a capacity building or an advisory team that then goes in and builds the capacity of the supplier. So the idea, and I'm going to uh, respond to the cut and run and stay mm -hmm. and fix piece, because for us, these are long-term relationships. So it's not that we audit, we find a problem, and we pull out. Mm. Uh, the average tenure is 11 years of our business partners. Mm. Some have been with us for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So it's a mutuality, and it's a give and take. And the key bit is that it is in their interest uh, to comply because we have what we call a KPI system, mm -hmm. key performance indicators. And if they score well, and the KPIs are around the way they handle grievances, transparency, management commitment, and all of that, it's positively incentivized to allocation. Mm. So if they score well on social compliance, their orders they get will... get more orders. Exactly. Yeah. So it is in their benefit mm. to ensure that the workers' rights are protected. So it's, you know, it's, yeah, it, it all comes together. Now, I know with Walmart, um, and I think... The, the, uh, you stop using this term. There used to be what they would call a red list, right, or, or a, uh, a non-compliant supplier list. Is there, is there something like this that's also a kind of a green list? Uh, th th these are these are the really good ones. We're going to actually give them more business because they they're consistently uh, clean, and we can prove that they're clean. Yeah, and, and you know, to get into the supply chain, where they go through an onboarding audit, and mm -hmm. they have to pass that and go through certain steps, mm -hmm. education of, of how, how, what our expectations are. Yeah. And, um, and so we continue to monitor them with, with audits over time. And, you know, in, in those instances, I mean, we would, especially in our direct, direct sourcing global, um, areas, we would have a similar long-term relationship with a lot of the factories Got and the suppliers. Got it. Right up here, please. Oh, hey. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Judy, Judy Gerhardt at ILRF. Executive Director of the International Labor Rights Forum. Thanks for the panel. Good questions. Good, good questions, Ben, and great comments, Andy. I want to start by we're one of the organizations along with the global trade unions and Clean Clothes Campaign and Human Rights Watch and several other NGOs promoting the Transparency Pledge. And I want to thank Adidas because you guys your leadership on supply chain transparency and your early agreement to align with that pledge has been really great for helping us push that forward. And I do want to ask if um, Walmart has some thoughts on the possibility of looking into agreeing to align with the pledge. We did send several letters. Um, we haven't heard anything back about whether or not Walmart will consider trying to align with the pledge. We understand your supply chain is much more complicated than Adidas. And my thought is maybe if you could take a tranche of it and look at it specifically. Just, I have to just make one comment on the hotline piece. I think Andy really nailed it. It's not connecting to worker organizing, and it's not going to be effective in the long term. I think the way the hotlines are being set up from the top down, corporations allowing workers to give them information, and there's not a direct response, it, it kind of has the risk of creating audit fatigue, where workers at some point felt like, why should I bother talking to the auditor? It's just another auditor asking me more questions, and they've been here before, and they haven't done anything. We did some very specific detailed research on Amata Kotter. Two-thirds of the calls were coming in from men when it's an 80% woman workforce. Mm. So that should be a red flag for you guys. Mm. The other thing was um, the way the data is gathered, it's all gathered and amalgamated. And so, you know, there is no direct response to that worker. Labor voices, you know, we would like that information, but it's by the time we get it, by the time it goes public, it's stale. If you're trying to organize workers or you're trying to support workers who are repressed from organizing, that information is... It's, it, you know, the, the drive could be killed by the time that information becomes public. So the way the hotlines are being developed at the moment, 
risk undermining worker organizing, and they could be so powerful if they were done in a way that supports the kind of grassroots worker organizing, which leads me to my last question, which has to do with what do you do when you expose violations in a supply chain and they cut and run, the buyers cut and run? And I think we've danced around this question, but sometimes the buyers cutting and running is a combination of the governments also pulling the rug out from underneath that that group of suppliers. So how do we, how do we address this? And I, I would go again to how do you get the brands to work with the grassroots groups and the base of workers so that there's sort of a, a bit more of a, a, a demining approach, very, very carefully sort of extracting the problem without just creating a cut and run. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Um, so there were three questions, and the first was directed to you, Doug, so I'll let you take yeah, it. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the pledge, sorry, um, to be able to answer that question about do, it. Do you want to describe what it is? No, I don't think that the expert <laughs> describe what it is. Uh. So it's, it's pretty basic. I mean, for 20 years, we've been asking brands to publish their supplier lists. And all it is is it's simply a bit more systematized now where we're asking brands to create a searchable list. And it, it gets a little more specific about what we're looking for in terms of addresses and things like that. But it's a, it's a pretty simple concept. And we're asking brands, um, it's not even sign up to the pledge. It's just can you align right. with this pledge? Yeah. And Adidas mm -hmm. is already on it. But uh, clearly we need to find a better contact because we've been writing to some of your staff. And <laughs> it's a big organization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, is there any um, at least mapping exercise within Walmart to understand the, the, the different tiers? Yeah, in, in specific supply chains where we see more of a risk, we would, we would go deeper and try to map it out. Got it. Um, like we didn't have done in Thailand. And, and, and at some point, will there be uh, greater transparency for consumers and activists on that? That's our hope. Okay. <laughs> we, we hope to get there. Um, it's, I mean, where do you start? Um, one of the things that we... We have piloted right now that's going on in China. Hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with blockchain, but um, blockchain is what underlies Bitcoin and, and is a very public, uh, non-controlled type of a thing, but hmm. has very, very accuracy and, and allows transparency. Yeah. So we're piloting something with a pork producer there Got it. Um, to, to see how that goes on our, our food safety side. Got it. And, um, and, and learn from that kind of as an experiment to see, you know, is there a way to do this? Right, right. Uh, and there were two other questions in there, Judy. Forgive me, we're, we're, we're running a little shy on time, uh, but uh, does anybody want to take the, those other two? I'm happy to actually specifically respond to uh, the worker um, hotline, hotline yeah. grievance mechanism, call it what you may. Uh, really, our experience has been contrary to what uh, Andy and I'm sorry, I forget the name. Judy. 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 Uh, because uh, so the, the success of any grievance mechanism is in a. Of course, the workers need to trust it, and if they see a response, so um, sorry, a follow-up exactly, mm -hmm. and an immediate one. Uh, and I'm, and the way this the application works is then it's all collected on an online dashboard mm -hmm. where the suppliers have the information. And Adidas is tracking this. Mm. So we know what grievance is coming in, what has been the response, and all of this we can do on our phones. All of us, we have access. Uh, so sometimes what happens is, in Indonesia, for example, it has actually helped uh, prevent a strike because the workers have written in and said mm -hmm. that, you know, this is the issue. So the, we were able to flag it with the management. The management had a conversation with the trade unions and, you know, were able to resolve the issue. In China, a negative example would be a worker, you know, raises a question around wages. Mm. And the response from management has been, please contact the payroll department. And I'm like, that's not a satisfactory response. <laughs> but according yeah. to them, they've answered it in 48 hours or mm. whatever the timeline mm. is. And it's yeah. been, but for the worker, where does that leave the worker? So the, the key yeah. is in the training of the supplier mm -hmm. and also having these, we have these honest conversations with workers as mm. well. Mm. So when we launch it in China, when we launch this, we had to literally, you know, there was a pushback from the supplier saying we can't get all our workers for this launch ceremony. And we said we won't launch till we have all the workers mm. there because we want to tell them directly, this is your chance to talk to us, to talk to, your, to the suppliers and to get the responses that you're seeking. Mm. Uh, and the pushback was because, you know, it's 10 minutes off the production line, what's going to happen? And we said, that's fine. Mm. You know, we will 
that's that don't worry about order allocations and things like that mm -hmm. and capacity we want each worker to be able to listen to adidas management mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. in and and not just people from social and environmental affairs our sourcing yeah. team is like i was telling you earlier is as enthused sometimes even more than us to do the right thing so so just to sum it up you are defining the welfare of those workers in your sphere of influence and concern i think that's a very very important yeah. Declaration, uh, and it's and it's important for consumers to understand as well Absolutely. when they're deciding who to buy from. Um, is that Maurice? It is. Hey, uh, Maurice Middleburg, uh, one of the heroic organizations, Free the Slaves. Please. Thank you, thank you Ben. Uh, Maurice Middleburg with uh, Free the Slaves. I want to thank the panel for what's been a, a great conversation. I'd like to turn the conversation somewhat on its head because we've been sort of talking about working from the top down through the supply chain and really pick up on Andy's point about the empowerment of the workers at the source community. I was very struck what we see every day by Dependra's story where it is a highly vulnerable community, great impoverishment, and those are the people who inevitably are exploited and end up in labor slavery. And so the question I want to pose to you is to what extent are you thinking about working with those source communities? Because typically there are discernible patterns of migration that lead people into particular industries and sectors. We, we understand what those are and going back into those source communities and really working to empower the workers and the families in the source community so that they aren't vulnerable to exploitation by false labor recruiters and all sorts of other criminals. So here we're talking, talking about the vulnerabilities before they step on the ships, before they get in the, in the boats. Is there any partnerships or any work that uh, e uh, either Adidas or Walmart are, are doing around so, that? So, I mean, I, would, I don't know if we have time, but some quick history in terms of our migrant labor workforce, right? Uh, um, unlike the sectoral enslavement that we're seeing in the Thai fishing industry, for us in the apparel and footwear sector, A, this whole issue of zero recruitment fees, relatively new. In Adidas, uh, for example, our, uh, our migrant uh, workforce is fairly, fairly uh, limited. Uh, and when issues come up, we look at it on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, having said that, we are, we are also looking at zero recruitment fees. Mm. Now, uh, to respond to your question around worker empowerment, um, two examples come to mind. Um, like I was saying earlier, less, very, very few migrant workers, but Jordan, where we have one apparel supplier, uh, majority of the workers are from Nepal and Bangladesh. So there, we've ensured that the supplier is enrolled in the Better Work program that is run by the ILO. Uh, and Better Work is actually building the capacity of uh, private employment agencies in Nepal. Uh, so they're actually building this migrant mm. corridor, which is ethical, from the point of view from, of the sending country. Mm. Uh, and by virtue of you know, ensuring that our supplier is, is, is enrolled in that program. We are therefore ensuring that people who come in don't come in with debt bondage, don't come in having had to pay all these fees. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one piece when it comes to migrant workers. Another example is in Pakistan. Um, Sialkot uh, is, uh, was a base where uh, we had manufacturers uh, who were, you know, running this cottage industry, football uh, stitching. And uh, over time, we found a lot of child labor concerns there. Uh, so manufacturers sort of moved to, uh, you know, establishing independent centers. So what happened to the women? I mean, a huge population of women workers were, were made redundant. Uh, so we actually then went into the community and set up women-only stitching centers with inbuilt creches. Uh, and, you know, so that's, that's an example of actually going straight to the community and doing something for them. So This was with philanthropic Adidas money or how, how, what, what, with, was this with, with partnerships Adidas. with the suppliers or... Um, with Adidas money, wow. with a local NGO on yeah. the ground. Got it. Is there a foundation within Adidas yeah. that does this? No. I mean, there is a community affairs team in, in, in the headquarters. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, when it comes to suppliers, I mean, we don't, we don't have a philanthropic view. Mm -hmm. um, we actually believe that suppliers need to own most of these programs because, mm. and pay for them because that's where the ownership and the value comes from. But in these specific instances, uh, we're happy to, you know, support and, and, and pay. Um, Doug, I want to uh, uh, relay mm -hmm. Maurice's question to you yeah. as well in terms of the... Um, the, the workers that are working in situations that aren't their home communities, where they're away from their social network, obviously very vulnerable to exploitation, um, uh, oftentimes 
paying debts. Uh, you've mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the recruiter uh, uh, fee uh, initiatives that you're beginning in, right. in Thailand. Are there other circumstances? So, like you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, we're, we're, we've committed to the employer pays principle and we're, we're implementing that. And as I do that, uh, looking at this economic model of supply demand of the labor sourcing, we, we can't quite get at our level to all the different workers that are out there looking for a job in, say, Nepal, looking for a job in Malaysia, but we can get through the suppliers to their labor brokers and providers and actually change them and work with them so that when they're actually recruiting, they're doing it in the right way. And, and so, so that's how we're, we're trying to get to the migrant worker uh, so that, you know, they're recruited ethically and responsibly uh, to the supply chain in Malaysia, for example, in the electronics industry. Thank you. Great. Oh, so we'll take, we'll, we'll do a, a lightning round here. Uh, one question over here and then two, two quick ones here. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is uh, Stan Gassick. I'm with the United Food and Commercial Workers uh, International Union of North America, representing workers in the United States and Canada in the uh, food and retail industries. I'm also representing uh, UNI, Union Networks International, which is a global union federation representing over 20 million workers in the commercial, financial, uh, services, many, many related, related uh, industries and sectors worldwide. And uh, UNI, by the way, was, has been a very, very active partner with the Accord, as I distinguish that from the Alliance with regard to Bangladesh, and uh, has obviously has a great, great interest in this conference, and, and congratulations, and congratulations to all the panelists for a, for a great debate. Um, one sort of very more technical ILO-based question, and, and then a, a bit of a comment. I just was very, very interested in hearing our representative from Adidas talking about how, how, uh, how better work of the ILO has been a very important component in all of this. I'm just, <clears throat> I was curious as to whether the ILO and ILO conventions, particularly 97 and 143 with regard to migrant workers, are very, very, are a good <clears throat> point of reference. Is this, are your companies, you know, looking, looking to that, and particularly in relating, in relating with the governments in which you're operating. And just, uh, I wanted to actually just uh, sort of underscore the questions and the comments that Judy has made, and particularly to, uh, to commend Andy for bringing front and center the role of organizing collective bargaining in all of this. I think this is very, very critical, and I think often gets uh, lost in the equation. I won't uh, revisit the debate around the efficacy of hotlines. I think this has been, uh, been sorry. handled, but yeah. Sorry, sorry. Sorry to cut you off. I, just, I want to be fair, fair to the others here. And, um, but that, that was a good question. We'll um, direct that to you guys in one second. Let's just well, take two more here. Hi, yeah. I'm Anbin, and I'm also from Walmart. I just wanted to address the question from Free the Slaves, actually. Um, particularly, these issues are regional. They're sending and receiving uh, countries in terms of patterns of migration. And when we're looking at Southeast Asia, um, you know, with Thailand, with the Burmese and Cambodia. And so um, I wear the government relations hat, and we're really looking at how can we engage U.S. ASEAN, you know, different um, governmental agencies, you know, to look at their uh, vulnerabilities at their borders and look at the issues there, too. So I think that's really critical. And we have the Walmart Foundation, um, our sustainability worker dignity project, and really looking at how we can develop a strategy um, once we understand the situation more fully. That's partly the funding um, that isn't directly to Walmart, but funding for knowledge in the space in general, um, where there's knowledge sorry gaps. To, sorry um, to interrupt. Yeah. I, I, we, That's it. Okay, okay. thanks. Okay. Um, do you have a question? Um, thanks. Adidas and Walmart, what you guys are doing is impressive. It's good to hear. My question is two-prong. In identifying issues, uh, there might be migrant workers who, are not, who do not want to report because they may not have any other option, right? Yeah. So there are people who may not use your apps. So what kind of outside third-party data are you using to identify issues where the people are not willing to report? And question two is, if you don't have that data, what kind of data do you wish you had available on your tier one through tier n suppliers that you could use to better manage this issue. To be clear, that, that was addressed to, uh, to, to both of them because to our they have a big market. Okay. 
So very quickly, because I know we're almost at yeah. 620. Um, this data, so the apps is, is, is run in four countries, and not in Thailand. Again, Thailand is a very small uh, uh, sourcing base, uh, 15, 15 factories. Um, and when we, f so the, the way we find this data is really through what Andy mentioned is off-site interviews. Interviews with workers that are happening not in the factory uh, environment. And like I said, because we've been working with these suppliers for a very, very long time, um, you know, there is this mutuality, uh, there is a trust and so the workers also open up. And every time we find a coach or a, of somebody who's afraid, then again it links back to the KPI piece that I spoke about earlier, that you know, the factory receives a negative scoring. So short answer is it's really through off-site interviews uh, and obviously, you know, so it's, it's a triangulation. You have the audit, you, have, you look at the facility, you get a sense. Uh, and like I used earlier, forensic, we, we, we look to find. Uh, we don't send in auditors with a, you know, Tick, 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 tick. So, yeah. Yeah, I would echo a lot of that. I mean, we, we have to triangulate the audits. Um, you know, you get the audits, and uh, that's only so much. Uh, you know, we rely on, uh, we, we take seriously any allegations that come from outside third parties. Um, and, uh, uh, and there are also uh, so, 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 sorry, Andy. Anything to add on the third-party data question or the uh, yeah. or, or the ILO uh, convention question? Analytics in it. So, what kind of work are you doing trying to get insight out of your data? So, I think that I want to say that what the work that companies are doing with hotlines, with audits, is positive. It's improving. It's getting mm -hmm. better. You know, these audits are getting better. They're getting more systematic. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a role for audits. They can give workers voice, and they're being more. Effective, you know, we see that with Adidas's audits, we see that with off-site audits, we see that with triangulation, you know, it's getting better. The hotlines are important, they have a role to play. But I really believe, based on my experience, that companies need to look at these hotlines and how the complaints are being addressed and the long-term impact of those complaints because they often don't follow up one month, two months, three months later. Mm. And you can see that there's often detrimental effects, including workers being murdered. Yeah. You know, as a result of yeah. contacting yeah. these hotlines. Yeah. And then finally, just to say, in relation to safe migration, you know, I just want to make the point in Thailand now, whatever's been happening in the seafood industry in Thailand, there is still no legal way for fishermen to come into the Thai fishing industry today. You know, you can only be smuggled or trafficked into the country. The countries from Myanmar, from Cambodia, they will not formally send their workers into the fishing industry. Mm. And that is a failure of the governments and of the industry to bring about formal channels of migration into the Thai fishing industry that needs to be addressed. So. And a, an, an, an excellent point to end on. Um, I began by talking about the, the corporate might that we have on stage here. Um, I want to leave you all with a reminder. These are publicly listed companies, uh, as are others. Uh, and ultimately, their owners are all of us. Um, and, and particularly through the products that we buy, we have to remember that the price that we see may be more than what's on the price tag. Uh, and rewarding those companies that uh, believe in transparency, that seek to accelerate transparency, and moving away from those companies that use that word proprietary too much. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and thanks to Monique. <laughs>